Previously, we looked at line integrals over vector fields, and we came up with the following uh, notion. So if we've got a vector field F, which I'm putting in two dimensions right here, although this can easily be extended into n dimensions. So it's P comma Q. In other words, it's P in the I direction and Q in the J direction. And it also has two variables, X and Y, which I'm not writing in there. And then we have a curve who has a vector form R, which is defined by X comma Y. Those are the coordinate functions there. And then T runs from A to B in order to parameterize this curve. So we had this line integral over the vector field um, F and the curve C was given notationally by this uh, integral over C of F dot dr. And that was turned into a scalar integral in the following way. So this is equal to the integral uh, from A to B of our vector field F dot R prime DT. So recall that the dot product of two vector functions is a scalar function. So this turns this very quickly into a calculus two type integral. Now I want to extend this down a little bit to get another notation which is commonly used for these types of line integrals. And then we'll do some examples. So here, notice that uh, given the fact that F equals uh, this vector field PQ, we can write this as the integral from A to B of P comma Q dot, and then we know R is given by X, uh, Y, so this is gonna be DX, DT, DY, DT, DT. Now we can go ahead and do this dot product, and we'll get the integral from A to B of P DX, DT, DT, plus Q dy dt dt. Um, but the next thing that we can do is um, kind of put these back into a scalar integral, but now it's gonna be a scalar integral over dx and dy. So now I'll change this from being bounds from A to B to being over the um, curve C again, and then I'll collapse this dx dt dt down into just dx, so this is P dx plus Q dy. Great. So we've got something like that. So I just want to point out that this is just another notational convention for the same kind of thing. You could have a line integral over a vector field given in this vector form right here or given in this form down here. So it's either f dot dr, which that hides all of the component functions, or we can think about it as p dx plus q dy, and that doesn't hide any of the component functions. Okay, so now that we've got that, I want to do some more examples of these line integrals over vector fields. Okay, our first example we want to look at is this one. So we have the integral over the curve C of x cubed y dx minus x uh, dy. And then C is going to be the circle of radius 2, so x squared plus y squared equals 4. That is oriented in a counterclockwise uh, direction. So in other words, we have this circle of radius radius uh, 2, and then it's being drawn in this counterclockwise way. And we want the entire circle here. But in order to get the entire circle, um, it's very easy to get an idea for what the parameterization of this circle should be or what the vector form, and we'll be motivated by polar coordinates in this case. So we'll take r to be equal to 2 cosine t, uh, 2 sine t, and then we'll take t going from 0 to 2 pi because we want the entire circle. And you might think that we're overcounting this point right here at uh, 2, 0 because um, that happens when t equals 0 and t equals 2 pi. And you'd be totally right. But in fact, that doesn't really matter because um, it's a single point And a single point will not contribute to the value of an integral. In fact, if you want to get really technical about it, um, if you could add on as much of a set of quote unquote measure zero and it doesn't contribute to the integral at all. So we could actually add on to this curve all the rational numbers, but all the rational numbers form a set of measure zero and so that wouldn't change um, the value of the integral.
for what it's worth. Okay, so now let's turn this into parametric equations. So that means x equals two cosine t, y equals two sine t. But what that tells us is that dx dt equals negative two sine t, and then uh, dy dt equals uh, two cosine t, just by like standard derivatives. But now we've got all of the parts to work this back in this direction. So if this is really the way to transport from uh, the notation f dot dr into a scalar integral where we have f dot r prime, this direction right here, this leftward arrow, is the quickest way to transport this into a computable integral. p dx plus q dy is going to be p dx dt dt, and then q dy dt dt. And then notice you can factor a dt out of this. So uh, let's go ahead and do that. So that means our integral up here is going to become the integral from 0 to 2 pi of x cubed times y. But notice x is equal to 2 cosine t, so that's going to be 8 cosine cubed t. And then times y, that's going to be 2 sine t, and now we have dx dt, so that's going to be minus 2 sine t, okay? Now to that we need to uh, subtract x, so that's going to be 2 cosine t, and then dy, but that's going to be dy dt, so here we have 2 cosine t again, and then dt out in front of the whole thing. Okay, so let's just look at all the parts here. All of this is going to be x cubed. This is y. This is dx dt. And now here we have this guy is x and this guy is dy dt. So we have in fact uh, kind of reversed this calculation here to get us to a scalar integral. Okay, now we can simplify this a little bit. So notice that's going to be the integral from 0 to 2 pi. Here we have 8 times 4, which is 32, and it's also negative. So we have negative 32. And now notice we've got cosine cubed and then sine squared. And then we have minus 4 cosine squared t, and then the whole thing is dt. Um, okay, great. So I'll clean up the board and I'll bring this uh, up to the top and then we'll compute this integral. So we were left at this integral. So uh, it has two parts and each part we're going to attack in a slightly different way. So for this guy right here, we're going to separate this out into a uh, cosine um, squared t times cosine of t. We're going to save the single cosine with dt and do a substitution. And then over here, we're going to write cosine squared of t as 1 half 1 plus cosine of 2t. Again, that's just like a formula that's kind of well known. Um, okay, great. So now let's go ahead and split up the integral into two integrals so that we can uh, perform uh, the necessary calculations on each. So here we have the integral from 0 to 2 pi. I'm going to go ahead and take a 32 out of this first integral, a negative 32, I should say. And then I have uh, cos squared t, sine squared t, and then um, cos t dt. So I'll put that part together. And then uh, I'm going to have minus 4 over 2. So that's going to be minus 2, the integral from 0 to 2 pi of 1 plus cosine of 2t dt. Fantastic. So now we can use a trig identity, um, which, uh, so now we can go ahead and write cosine squared as 1 minus sine squared, which really shows us that we can do a substitution for this first integral. So notice the appropriate substitution for this first integral will be u equals sine of t. That's going to make du equal to cosine t dt. So notice that's going to change this to 1 minus u squared. Then we have another u squared there. And then this guy is going to be du.
Now let's see what happens to the bounds of integration. Um, so notice when t equals zero, that means u is equal to sine of zero, which is zero. So that means u is equal to zero. When t is equal to two pi, that means u is equal to sine of two pi, which is zero. So that means this is going to change into minus 32, the integral from zero to zero of one minus u squared times u squared du. And now we can actually stop calculating this because we've got an integral from zero to zero, um, which that's obviously just gonna cancel out. Okay, now we can take the antiderivative of this guy, so that's gonna give us minus two, and now we have t um, plus one half sine of two t. We need to evaluate that from zero to two pi. But notice if we plug zero into sine or two pi into sine, that's gonna be zero. So all we get is uh, the contribution from, from plugging two pi into t, which is going to give us negative four pi in the end. Okay, and that's the end of this example. So I'll clean up the board and then we'll do one more. So for our next example, we'll calculate the following line integral over a vector field. Again, in this notation, this PDX plus QDY notation. So we've got the line integral over C, XY DX minus cosine X DY, and C is the line segment 3, 2 to 5, negative 1. So first we need to parameterize that line segment. but Luckily, there's a nice formula to parameterize line segments and it goes like this. One minus t times the starting point plus t times the ending point. And that's because if you plug t equals zero into this, you're obviously at the starting point, this disappears. If you plug t equals one into this, you're at the ending point because this guy disappears. So in this case, that's going to give us 1 minus t. Our starting point is given by 3, 2 plus t. Our ending point is 5, negative 1. So we've got something like that. But uh, notice we can put that together into one single vector. So we're going to have 5t minus 3t uh, plus 3. So that's going to be 2t plus 3 in this component. And then in the next component, uh, let's see what we're gonna have. We're going to have negative three t plus two. So we've got a negative two t from there and then a negative one t from there and then a two from the first thing. Okay, so we've got that. But notice uh, for this notational convention for uh, line integrals, we really need parametric equations instead of uh, vector equations. So that means x is going to be 2t plus 3, y is going to be minus 3t plus 2, and then as usual when we're parametrizing in this method, we have t goes between 0 and 1. So that's what we'll use. So now what we can do is apply this formula, which means this integral up here is going to be the integral from zero to one of x times y. So notice that'll be two t plus three times minus three t plus two, and then dx dt, so that's from this part right here, but notice dx dt is just two, so that's nice, especially when we've got uh, line segments here, the derivatives are really simple because obviously they are lines and so their derivatives will always be constants. Great, and then minus cosine of x, but notice that's gonna be minus cosine of 2t plus three, and now we have dy dt, so that's gonna give us minus three, and then all of this is inside our t integral. Now, uh, we can simplify this quite a bit. This will be the integral from zero to one of, so let's see this term. So we have two t times negative three t, that's gonna be negative six t times two, that's gonna be negative 12 t squared. Now let's look at the cross terms. We've got two t times two, that's four t, minus nine t is minus five t, times two is gonna be minus 10 t. Now let's look at the constant terms. 3 times 2 is 6, times 2 is 12, so that's plus 12. 
Okay. Now, uh, left over, we've got this negative 3 times that negative 1, so that's going to be plus 3. And then the cosine evaluated at 2t plus 3 dt. So that is the integral that we need to calculate. Okay, I'll clean up the board, bring this up, and then we'll finish it off. We left off at this spot. So we have this integral of this polynomial and then this trig function, but luckily these all have really nice antiderivatives. So notice uh, this guy right here is going to be negative 12 over 3, which is negative 4t cubed. Here we're going to have negative 10 over 2, so that's going to be negative 5t squared plus 12t from that guy. And now the antiderivative of this, so the antiderivative of cosine is sine, so that's going to give us plus uh, 3 sine of 2t plus 3, but now we think about it. If we take the derivative of that, we will get cosine of 2t plus 3, but then by the chain rule we'll have uh, multiplied by 2, so that means if we undo that, we need a, a 2 down in the denominator here. And we can easily check that the antiderivative of this term is the term right above it. Now uh, we'll go ahead and evaluate this from 0 to 1. And notice evaluating this at 1 will give us, uh, let's see, that's going to be 12 minus 5 minus 4, so that'll be 3 plus uh, 3 halves and then sine of 5. So that's what we get if we evaluate sine of 2t plus 3 at 1. That's just sine of 5. You can't really simplify it. Now let's go ahead and plug 0 in there. So notice this polynomial is obviously going to 0 out. And then we'll get minus 3 halves sine of 3. Okay. So, could you maybe put these two signs together using some sort of obscure uh, trig identity? Um, yeah, probably, but it's not really worth it. And is it really that obscure of a trig identity? Well, probably not, but you know, I don't have those things really memorized. So, um, anyway, it's not really helpful. I think this is a good place to end this example and this video. So, good.